Yama. I'm Luke Pearson, Gomeroy Man and founder of Indigenous X. Indigenous X has been invited to curate this panel today to talk in response to Black Lives Matter and speak to some of the reforms that are much needed across the country in a number of different areas in response. Black Lives Matter has been a global movement, obviously beginning in America in response to police brutality and the killing of African-American people by police. In Australia, it's resonated on a number of different issues with a number of different communities, obviously Indigenous Australia with over-policing, over-incarceration rates and most notably Aboriginal deaths in custody. But it also speaks to our refugee communities and members of the African diaspora along similar lines of institutional racism, police brutality and need for reform. So our panel today will be led by Larissa Berent, who will introduce the manners and lead the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. It is my great privilege to introduce our panel. Tony McAvoy, SC, is a wordy man from the central Queensland area around Clermont. He is also a native title holder in his grandmother's country around Thargaminda in southwest Queensland. He's been a barrister since 2000 and senior counsel since 2015, the first Indigenous Australian to get that honour. He currently chairs the New South Wales Bar Association's First Nations Committee and is a member of the New South Wales Bar Indigenous Joint Working Party on Over-Incarceration. He is co-chair of the Law Council of Australia's Indigenous Legal Issues Committee and is a member of the Law Council's In Indigenous Incarceration Working Group. He was co-senior counsel assisting the Dondale Royal Commission. Deng Thiak Adut was a former child soldier from South Sudan before he immigrated to Australia. He earned his law degree at Western Sydney University and now works as a refugee advocate and lawyer. His story has been an inspiration to many and his is an important and powerful voice. He was named the 2017 New South Wales Australian of the Year. Deng, I might start with you and ask how you felt when you first saw those images of George Floyd. Um, and I'm interested if you could share with us the emotions and thoughts that came to you when those images were sent around the world? Um, to be honest with the answer, um, I didn't feel any different. My thought was something that is often that I see on television. And it was something that is, I would say, have nothing to do with me, generally, even though who was a black man, I, he's American, he's not African, and I'm more concerned of the African here in Australia, or indigenous people in Australia, and in general, every Australian uh, that are here. So if it was an Australian uh, man, I would have thought differently. I would say uh, that's wrong. But that is a different business. That's none of my business. But what I was more concerned of was, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former child soldier. I know the injuries people suffer. I know what force I, I was trained uh, properly. Uh, I know what you can do with your hand to hurt somebody, or even placing your knee. But that man was, he was slipping, just almost, he was just using him as a mattress. So I was like, hmm, that is something that I shouldn't be talking about, but yes, um, it's none of my business. I shouldn't be talking about something else that concerned me in Australia. I think that would be my business. And that's where the Black Lives Matter uh, came into when I, when I touch on those issues concerning Australia. But at this stage, it's America. And those people, how they got there, we all know very well how they got there. And so, I can, can talk about it. I'm going to talk about it specifically things that concern me in Australia. That's how I look at it. And um, I'd love to come back to you on that next, but I just want to ask you, Tony, have you been surprised by the response across the US and around the world, and particularly in Australia, to those images of George Floyd, given how long this has been an issue in Australia? Yes, uh, I was surprised, not initially, but as it went on through the days and weeks, I was surprised 
um, and I think I hadn't quite understood how deeply uh, affected people were by the, the video, which was, if you watched it, it was, it was heart-wrenching. Uh, and that combined with, I think, the times that we're in, where people have had uh, downtime with, with the COVID-19 virus, had, and they've had time to think about the type of society that they want to live in. And while um, I'm on all of these committees, which you uh, so nicely spelt out, um, we have been working hard. The, the members of that, those committees work very hard to try and engage at all levels to bring about change. And we run into brick walls and we find limited uh, levels of assistance. But what I think happened uh, with the George Floyd and the uh, death and the Black Lives Matter campaign is that it tapped into people's sense of what sort of society they want to live in. Do they want to live in a society where uh, unfairness and um, a, a lack of equality pervades the, the society? And I, and I think what's happened is that a large number of people have said no. They've had time to think about it and they've said, no, we don't want to live in that society. And, and I was pleasantly surprised by the level of support that, is, that has come out. And I, I think that level of support, which you've seen in, in the United States and, um, and that which you're seeing here, uh, is enough um, to move political opinion. Deng, just to come back to the observation you made about how it's perhaps important to think more locally and about the issues around us. I wonder if you could then talk to us about what, the, what Black Lives Matter means to you in the Australian context. What are the <coughs> issues that should be resonating with us? Uh, thank you very much. And I think this is the most beautiful question, part two, and I think Tony uh, and I would share the same opinion and nearly every single Australian we share a similar opinion. Um, last year, I do remember the High Court decision concerning Indigenous fellows that were locked up at a detention centre and they wanted to deport them somewhere. Sometimes people cry, sometimes people hurt a lot. But I couldn't believe that there is a high court there in Australia that will look after interests of black fellows or people like me. Or a man that had a blood of Aboriginal drop in his skin and he still couldn't even define what is this guy's status was. He's left in a limbo. He's Aboriginal. I'm not Aboriginal. My citizenship is rubbish compared to his bloodline. That drop of blood, it make my citizenship look like a piece of crap, in my view. But we deny them. We even went to a high court. It was Mary Gordon who said that this is unacceptable. When do we have to go back? To, where do we go? This is full of stuff for me. So for me, is I don't even think there is, there is any, any judicial system that can protect a black man. I think maybe a political will is, 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 is a solution at the moment. But when I caught, stop right there at defining these indigenous people, I, my heart was broken. And I decided that I shouldn't even be here in Australia if these people are not here. Let's go to Tony's point about what kind of country we want. Um, I just want to go back to something you said, Tony, because of course the, there has been, a, 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 as you mentioned, a real shift in public perception and public awareness of these issues. But I was wondering, um, do you think at this moment that there is the possibility to lead to greater changes to the sorts of reforms you mentioned that your committees were working on? Um, is the system ready to change? I don't believe that the system is ready to change right now. In fact, I think that we only need to look at the 
response from the New South Wales Commissioner for Police when confronted with the young Aboriginal man who'd had his the child, had had his feet swept out from underneath him by a police officer and his face slammed into the cement. The Commissioner for Police was, um, said something along the lines of, I think that that constable would agree he was having a bad day. And that's the attitude of an apologist for what is discriminatory and uh, totally unacceptable conduct. Similarly, at the national level, we uh, had the Prime Minister trying to deny that there had been practices of slavery in this country. And those that type of language and those types of responses are consistent with a, an attitude of, uh, there's nothing really to look at here. Let's move along. It's an American issue. Uh, we've got no problems here. And it's trying to say to the general population, don't get caught up in it. Don't worry about it too much. We are in a pretty good place. When in fact, um, of course we aren't. Uh, uh, the similarities in terms of systemic racism uh, are very strong. And um, we only have to look at some of the, the judgments in the courts. Uh, last year, uh, a, a coroner's report was handed down in relation to a death at a Tumut Hospital of an Aboriginal woman, Naomi Williams, a Wiradjuri woman, who had been denied um, service by, by the health workers uh, over a period of 12 months until uh, it reached a point where she died. And the coroner found that that, that um, was as a consequence of uh, systemic racism. Mm. We, we, uh, we only need to look at the coroner's report into the, the, the deaths of young people in, in Broome. Uh, there were 13 suicides, which the coroner in Western Australia looked at and found that, the coroner found that one of the factors that um, led to the position of despair, of such despair in these young people um, that they would uh, commit suicide uh, was the effect of um, intergenerational trauma as a result of the ongoing colonial process. Um, we have all of these uh, objective measures where uh, courts or reports have been completed and, and they all generally say that there is systemic racism in the way in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, First Nation people are treated in this country. And until we get to a point where government is prepared to acknowledge that yes, that's what is happening and uh, take action, um, I think that it's going to persist. And, and I think that um, state and, com and the Commonwealth government would like it to persist in its current form. And so in answer to the question of uh, is there change to come, I think that there is the potential for change to come, but um, it, it would take a substantial movement. And the, the support that we've had through the Black Lives Matters campaigns uh, in Australia could be converted to political power if, for instance, every one of those people that attended a Black Lives Matter rally wrote to their local member and said, I will not vote for your party unless it does something uh, substantial to address the systemic racism uh, uh, against uh, people of colour in this country. Uh, and I, I don't know whether people are, are committed enough to, to write to their local member and say that, but you know, if it's just us uh, and our 3% are saying the things that we've been saying for the last 30 years, I don't think we can force that change. If those people who have shown their support and their unwillingness to accept the, the system as it is uh, come along with us, well, then uh, I think there is potential for, for some change. Jing, Tony talks about the systemic racism. Yes. And we can look at judges who make decisions, are yes. products of a society, police officers who engage in, in conduct that is questionable and, and inappropriate are products of society. I was wondering what your thoughts are about how we go about addressing the
the attitudes more broadly in the community. How do, from your perspective, how do we tackle that racism? How do we change people's perspectives more broadly? This is 2020. And by the way, I've been in this country so far for 20, 22 years and one day from today. Yes, came to Australia June 1998, 26th of June and yesterday. Uh, it was my 22nd year of living here. And uh, these 22 good years, what I've seen so far have been a progress that is worthwhile to realize. And the Australian community have been working so hard. I'm talking about Australian community. But what in the parliament house? What's in the parliament house? do not represent us. None of them. Prime Minister, w w does he like me? No. Black man like me? No. Hell no. That's why he, he basically condoned what the police uh, said. You know, or say there's no systemic racism, or say, well, the police officer had a bad day. How could he have a bad day when you are a responsible person? You see, there is no responsible parliament. Each of them will never take responsibility for what they say or what they do. Their promises have been empty. For me, I just say it as a black man, all I gotta do is, uh, I just gotta take it. I will take this racism. I'm not gonna stop them from doing it. They've been practicing it like a football game and uh, they've been, they have upper hands and let them do it. It's, let them do it. I, I just think that uh, it's okay if I die eventually, or any other people die, like George, uh, George, uh, George Floyd, or indigenous brothers are being locked up, incarcerated. It's like we have a concentration camp being built in our, our, our country. And if a black child die, I would actually, I'm quite happy to even Film it, keep it, keep it on, and then let the police. I won't even persecute the person that who, who kill uh, these black people because they get a ticket, they get a license. When they go to court, the court doesn't do much attached to it. All this man gonna get is basically nothing. He's gonna get a slap on the wrist. Maybe he's gonna flee mental illness. Other than that, and he had a bad day. A bad day, basically, he will flee to mental illness or stress related. But why do you give a man a gun? in his hand and give him a taser when you know he has a stress. What is he gonna do, ruin a community? Do something bad. So I don't think um, there is anybody in the parliament house there that I would rely upon and say that I will vote for them. I'm not gonna vote for none of them this, uh, this election. What I will do basically is, um, I, I'll put my votes on my ass where it belong, but I'm not voting for none of them. What is, what are they gonna do? Nothing. So I, I don't have a trust in the political system at this stage until there's a new politician come in. But most of them being diagnosed in the parliament house. They've been there for 20, 10 years, 15 years, and doing the same calculated crime against uh, black fellows. That's what I'm saying. So uh, I don't agree, I don't believe about Tony say that the change may come. It, it may not come. This is, you just become a, uh, the first Aboriginal cynic QC. This is 2020. So I don't think there's any much will change. All we gotta do is just keep working hard, doing the best we can do to help everybody that live among us. And we're not gonna, I don't think Tony gonna stop doing that. I'll do the same thing. But in terms of looking at the other man, the other side, is I'm not expecting anything much from that person. I expect worse from him. I just have a hopes. And that's all the greater thing that I have carried all my shoulders. And I know I will tell people, keep hoping, but otherwise the government is not there to answer any, it's not there to, to give us any answers. Tony, one of the conversations that's flowed from the attention to Black, Black Lives Matter and the spotlight coming on uh, a lot uh, more broadly onto Aboriginal deaths in custody are concepts of justice reinvestment and the notion of defunding the police. And I wondered if you could share your thoughts on those strategies around how we should be approaching things like policing. 
it's an interesting um, discussion that's been having that's been happening around the notion of defunding the police. It's become a catch cry for holding the police forces around the world to account, and um, it. I think it frightens some people because they think it means we will have no police. But but what is intended by that statement, that that catch cry, defund the police, is that that the funding to the police is is largely taken away and directed towards community-based, community-led early intervention projects that will help community health and help community strength so that there isn't the need for the current model of, of community safety that we have where um, communities are left for, to fend for themselves and when people make mistakes, then, the, then the, they get to the feel the full force of the law. People are saying, well, that, that model's not working. And it's certainly not working in Australia um, because we, we know that the incarceration rate of, uh, of Indigenous people is, is going through the roof. Um, we know that it, it's continued to go up since the uh, recommendations in the, in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal and Islander Deaths in Custody was handed down in 1991, and it doesn't look like slowing. Um, and the way in which we are going about trying to address policing and the notion of incarceration as a, as a mechanism for community safety um, is failing. And this, there's no more stark contrast of the problems with the system uh, than the announcement last week of the um, $770 million prison in Grafton um, in an area which is largely populated by Aboriginal people. And we know that the, 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 a large percentage of that population, the, the prison population, some 1,700 prisoners are reportedly the largest in Australia, will be Aboriginal people from the north coast of New South Wales. It's a, it's a very sad day. Uh, the, the company that has the, the contract to service and run that jail is Serco, a, a worldwide company that has contracts for a whole range of things, including Villawood. And that, that contract to run that facility for 20 years, I think, is something like $2.6 billion. But we also know, those of us who are trying to push reform and be progressive, we know that the, the Justice Reinvestment Program in Burke, which has been uh, an, an outstanding success, has saved the, uh, the government millions of dollars and, and been done on a shoestring, um, the, there have been calls for that to be expanded. And the uh, Australian Law Reform Commission, in its report that it handed down two, almost three years ago, two and a half years ago, in December 2017, the very first recommendation that they made was that the, the justice reinvestment programs be rolled out across the country as a, as a mechanism for um, redirecting money out of the justice uh, uh, and policing and incarceration model to a community-led, community strengthening and community health model. There is no funding for that to be rolled out. It would cost a, a minute fraction of the cost of building that new jail at, at Grafton. And yet, Burke still remains a pilot project some five years down the track. Um, that report by the Australian Law Reform Commission on over-incarceration of Aboriginal people that came out in December 2017 has not even received a response from the federal government. There has been no response from the, uh, the state of New South Wales. And uh, we know that the justice reinvestment programs work, yet the the model that we're locked into in this country is one where people are locked up in jails and, the, and, the, and it's a whole industry which the government is party to. And I don't know how we break out of that. 
Jing, I just wanted to give you a chance if you had any thoughts about what Tony had said in your own thoughts about justice reinvestment and the concept of defund the police. I, I think that would make a great uh, difference to the community or make a great progress. Um, but to invest in a building, a jail, to lock up human beings, like this, some sort of stock, it's unacceptable. Especially uh, for me, as a member of African community in general, as Australian in general, as a member of um, humane society, I call it humane society. I'm not talking about animal protection society. There's humane society, people that treat human like a real human, with the respect, with the dignity, okay? Since I came to this country, Aboriginal people have never get what you call a dignity, never been recognized. That's one thing to put aside. For me, the jail that they're building, I know they will be putting more African in, more Sudanese in it. I know that. And of course, talking about Billowood, which is funded, I, a Sierra Leone man, a Sierra Leonean man, was murdered two years ago. Today, I represented that man but I haven't been received, I haven't been given a single page of paper just to say how did he die mm. because of Soko is controlling that. So if I don't know how this man died, the family don't know how he died, how would we ever know as Australian exactly how did this man die in general? But we're never gonna be told because it's run by Soko, it's run by a billion dollar company that's doing that. All I'm saying is, if any Sudanese person is listening to this, they should look at it carefully and say it. they should not let their child be in that prison. They can find a way now. A regional um, community should actually look at it and say that jail in Grafton should not even start, mm -hmm. begin with. If it have to be sabotaged by any way, they, they need to be sabotaged. We, we can go there and sit there when they're building it and let them hurt us with a greater, if that, that position is going to be the case. But it should not, uh, no more jail. They didn't, we need more reform. But yes, if I have to sit in that place and they have to kill me so that they build a jail, yes, I will do it. So it's a long way down the track. But yes, I will force that generally because unless they put their children in there, but they never put their children in there. They put other children in there. And destroying youth is a problem. Youth shouldn't be going to jail. No child should ever go to jail. But those children there, they have mothers and their parents. I think their parents and their mothers and their, and, and their general friends, whether you're white or black, they should go and sit in that jail in Grafton that the government is building, and we should stop it by any means. Let us go to jail. Maybe it would be a good idea for us to be locked up in that place because enough is enough building jail for what? We need to build society, not cages. And my view is, yes, just a reinvestment, reinvestment is important. It's important, not taking money away from the police. Who, who, who need the police? Who, who, who need the police that, 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 that hurt people? We don't need those people. We need the proper police officers, the ones who understand the community. So, yes, some of them have to lose their job. And if you're going to lose your job because you've done something wrong, and then that's okay for me. You didn't do anything right. But yeah, how can we move the community forward when we know the money is sitting there and it's gonna be reinvested into a cages? No, I can't do that. I will even refuse to pay tax at all if that jail is gonna be funded for my money, the money that I work hard for, especially when Sudanese kids are gonna go to jail. No, I refuse and I tell, uh, I'm gonna say that I know we all should do it if that the case is because your dollar should not be used to murder somebody else. I just pick up on one point you made there, which is important, and that's about the need to find alternatives for young people so they don't end up in prison. Yes. I just wonder if you could share your thoughts from your work, your experience about the sorts of strategies that do work that we should be using to ensure that young people don't end up in prison. Fair enough. I, I don't think they're the solution for youth in this country. I know I can fix it. I can fix the problem. I don't need money to fix the problem with youth. All I need is a consent from the government or their parent 
I, I can take them for a camping, for a camp. Even indigenous boys that are not initiated because they're not men. They're acting like boys. They don't know responsibilities. It, it's the reason why they do all kind of bad things. So is our Sudanese and other African community. Give those responsibilities to me. I don't need to be a lawyer. I can be a better social worker, unpaid. I can do that job. But these kids, they don't have a guide. The police is on their heels 24 7 because they are, to, they are basically, what do I say, lost children? If you are a lost child, like me when I was a kid, didn't know what to do, why does a man with a gun have to follow me around to lock me up because I did something silly? Why do I have to be? have to be so important when I'm actually a silly kid acting something, uh, doing something so silly that, that I can be slapping the finger. But no, our kids go to jail for basically swearing out the police. I'm just telling you the truth. I don't need to be in this country. I said before, there's no need of bringing refugee here to this country when you haven't solved the problem of these people, especially the indigenous people. If you haven't resolved the problem, why bringing a man in here? Who, who basically doesn't need it, somebody has needed. So that have to be the first step, indigenous people, children. The first nation, they have to be comfortable. They want, they, they're the one that need to welcome us here as refugee. And if they welcome us here, we can then take on their culture, learn the process. But they have not even a chance to even to teach us who are they, their language. Like today, Tony just told me, you say Yinga, Yinga in my language means the same thing. I could have learned more from him, but I didn't have that opportunity to even sit with an elderly uh, indigenous person in general. So our kids, they're just going to be in the same boat in general. Enough is enough. No more jail. We have families. And we can't take children away from their families. Enough is enough in my view. Tony. You um, were heavily involved as, um, in, in the Dondal Royal Commission, uh, which put a spotlight on the treatment of Indigenous young people and in a way revisited a lot of the issues that were looked at in the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And I was wondering if you could share some of the reflections from that experience about uh, your thoughts on how we could better deal with uh, issues around Indigenous youth, and particularly alternatives to prison and the sorts of treatment we saw uh, that led to that Royal Commission? Mm. Firstly, one of the things that was very obvious to all that were involved in the Northern Territory Royal Commission into the protection and detention of children is that all around the Northern Territory, elders, Parents, communities were crying out for the opportunity to take care of their kids, to be put in a position where they could uh, provide better circumstances for their kids, give them things to do, teach them uh, their, their law and custom, um, give them direction. And uh, they were very confident that if they were able to do that, then um, that would have a big effect on the uh, number of kids who were having interactions with the police. They told us that they had been able to do a lot of things through their community organisations, but um, after the, the first the intervention in the Northern Territory and, and then the defunding of Aboriginal organisations and the funding of not other non-government organisations, non-Aboriginal non-government organisations to deliver services to their communities, um, they lost the capacity to do that type of work. Um, we heard um, some evidence during that Royal Commission from, um, from people here in Sydney, from Shane Phillips and uh, Superintendent Luke Freudenstein from the uh, Clean Slate Without Prejudice program in in. Redfern, and they talked about the great success that they had had in bringing the community, the Aboriginal community and the police together 
so that they were operating as members of the same community, um, participating in mentoring programs, attending boxing sessions in the morning, and, and the dramatic effect that had on the, the crime rate uh, in that community. Um, and one of the things that was obvious to me and to everybody involved in the Northern Territory, I think, is that that type of change to the way in which policing is undertaken needs to be driven from the top. Mm. It, without the superintendent of that local area command saying to his officers, particular behaviours were not going to be accepted, that the things were going to be done differently, that they were going to talk to um, the members of their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island com community with, his, with respect and treat, treat people humanely and, and try and be part of the community without that being driven from the top, there wasn't going to be any change. And one of the real dilemmas in, in the Northern Territory was how to convince those at the top that they really needed to drive that change. They needed to drive it through the investment of funds and they needed to drive the change of culture which was necessary for, um, for equality to exist and for, for racism to be um, defeated or at least um, suppressed. But, you know, we, we would be in the hearing rooms at the, in Darwin and you could, 50 metres from where the hearings were, hearing rooms were, you could see a, an old Aboriginal man having his, sitting down under a tree having a quiet drink and the police would come along and pour his alcohol out and, and make him leave the city. Um, but that afternoon or that evening, you would see backpackers walking down the main street of, of down Mitchell Street in Darwin, drunk, drinking on the streets, carrying on, being noisy, and the police would wave to them. How you going? And and when the when the the, the racism is that deep and systemic, where those two things can coexist. It's, there's not going to be any change unless the, the, those at the top are made accountable. And, and so, you know, um, in New South Wales, you, you would want that requirement that, to be written into the Police Act so that one of the functions of the Commissioner is to ensure that to the extent that racism exists within the New South Wales Police Force, all steps are taken to eradicate that racism doesn't exist in, in the legislation as it stands, but that's, that's, how, that's the level it needs to be done at. Um, so there's a lot of observations um, you know, I could speak about. It, we, we, it was a 12 month uh, process, but with a little bit of hindsight, I think that's the most lasting observation I can make is that while, there are, there are hundreds and perhaps thousands of people who are invested in trying to reform the justice system, to try and uh, reduce the incarceration rates, to protect people from uh, uh, brutality, to ensure that, uh, that deaths are properly investigated. Um, we, can, we can work at, um, for another 10 years or 20 or 30 years. Um, but the change won't come unless there is some commitment to having a different society um, from at the top. I'm really mindful that we're almost out of time. So I actually just wondered, I know this is a big question, Tony, but you talk about the need to change society fundamentally and, and Deng's spoken about that as well, that there needs to be something that gives us as you said, Deng, hope that we have to have something that will do that. I just wonder, I know you've thought really deeply about notions of treaty or treaties. Is that the sort of thing that we need? And how would something like that help to make changes at, at sort of, at, at fundamental issues like the criminal justice system issues we've been talking about today? Mm. One of the deep uh, problems that we have um, 
in Australia is a, uh, almost a total absence of respect for, uh, for First Nations people and our connection to our country. And we saw that in the destruction of the Jukin Caves um, with the, in the Pilbara by, uh, by Rio Tinto. And we see that uh, time and time again. Um, what Aboriginal, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people are, are seeking is some level of empowerment and control over our, our own lives. And I, I saw a study a number of years ago which uh, talked about the mental health impact of long-term disempowerment and how once a person is, is placed into, uh, had all their power stripped away from them, that that, that uh, over time causes grave mental health issues. And um, I, I just have this uh, sense that whilst treaties are not a, an answer to all problems, if we were given the respect to allow us to self-govern, to allow us to make decisions about uh, how our children are protected, to allow us to make decisions about how our country is protected, um, then I think that that would go a long way to changing the relationship um, between us and the rest of Australia. So that rather than being seen as something that as something that is the other and that needs to the, that the everybody else needs to be protected from, that we're a, a self-sufficient, thriving entity on our own or entities on our own. Um, it's a big, big subject. I know how unfortunate that we're out of time because I guess that's exactly the sort of relationship you were talking about, Ding, that you wanted to see. So thank you both for your insights into what is actually not just a very topical issue, but actually one that's, I think, takes a, a lot of emotion for, for Aboriginal people and for people of colour to actually speak about. We mentioned earlier that these aren't statistics to us, it's a lived experience. So I really want to thank you both for um, your wisdom around the issue and your generosity with sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I'd also like to thank Luke Pearson and James Saunders and the team at Indigenous X who curated today and our hosts at the Opera House for bringing this panel. My guests have been Tony McAvoy, SC, and Deng Thiak Adut. <laughs>